Good morning, Canisius High School community. It is Andy DL back with another episode of Conversations with Canisius, our regular web series where we check in with our alums all over the U.S. and hear about their great accomplishments since Canisius High School and learn about their careers. Uh, I am joined today by a very special guest all the way from our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. We are joined today by Rajiv Ramshan from the class of 1995. And Rajiv, I want to get this title right, so I'm going to look at my card. Rajiv is a senior behavioral scientist and co-director of the Rand Epstein Family Veteran, Veterans Policy Research Institute. It's a mouthful, but also, uh, I hope I got that right. Yeah. Great. Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us today. And we're just going to take a, a real quick walk back through memory lane and getting, getting us up uh, to your current position at Rand. But Rajiv... Good morning, and tell us a little bit about how you ended up at Kenesha's High School. That's easy. My brothers both went there. <laughs> so um, I graduated. I grew up in Lewiston, New York. I was born and raised in Lewiston, New York. And uh, uh, when it was time for my oldest brother, Nick, to go to, to, to high school, he chose Kenesha's. Uh, my brother, Sunil, followed a year later in his footsteps. And then uh, four years after that, it was my turn. And so... Um, I ended up at Canisius as well. <laughs> not, not a big, not a decision on your part, a decision made for you as, as it was for me, as I also had an older brother who was there and had a, had a great experience. So it, at, during your time at Canisius, what kind of clubs were you involved in and who were your, your big influences at, at the school? Yeah, great. So when I was at Canisius, uh, I was part of a lot of clubs. I was, um, in forensics, so speech and debate, uh, that was a big part of my, uh, Canisius High School life, uh, traveling all over New York State, um, and even nationally to participate in speech and debate. I was a member of the swim team. Uh, I was a member of the crew team as well. Um, those were kind of where I devoted a lot of my time. I did, I, I helped out with uh, the theater drama um, productions, once doing kind of set design, once I acted, in my senior year I acted in, in one of the plays. Um, but that, that was a lot of time actually swimming through <laughs> forensics and, and drama. That was, those were the big ones for me. That's a full slate. Yeah. How about, <laughs> how about favorite teachers? Anybody there that you recall as being sort of a charismatic adult or a formative influence on you? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I actually have two. Um, I had a religion teacher um, my freshman and sophomore year who also coached uh, forensics, uh, Father Hone, James Hone, um, who was really formative uh, for me. He had come actually, uh, he had kind of a circuitous route into, um, into the priesthood really, and it was just really in inspiring for me and was really respectful and was really great. Um, and then also I have to say, you know, especially my junior and senior year, Andrea Turpic Andres, who's now the principal at Canisius, uh, she taught me religion class and she was also, um, uh, advisor, I guess, of the speech and debate team. And uh, I can't say enough good things about Mr. McAndre. It's super formative, super um, instrumental in kind of making me the person I am today and, and kind of heading, helping me um, negotiate my career um, as well. That's great. That's great. So yeah. you graduated from Canisius in 1995. Uh, where you go, where, where do you do your undergrad and sort of talk about some of your early professional experience? Sure. So I graduated from Canisius in 95 and I think um, most important is that the thing I did immediately after is I left that summer, I left Buffalo in Western New York that summer and I went to live with my brother Nick, uh, also Canisius alum in Washington DC where I currently live. So um, I had an internship at the Sierra Club, which is an environmental organization. So I spent my mornings at the Sierra Club and I needed to make money. So I spent my afternoons working in retail at Banana Republic um, before <laughs> I went to college. Uh, so then, uh, so I lived with my brother and, you know, it was, we were five years apart. So it was kind of cool to live with him and just to like reconnect after having, you know, lived apart for five years when he was in college and I was in, in um, high school. So uh, after that, I went to the University of Chicago. I studied economics um, at the University of Chicago and um, economics was really, you know, I went into it, I was quantitatively oriented. I really wanted to do kind of public policy work and, and 
I thought economics was the way to go. And as I studied econ, I realized that certain aspects of it were interesting and others weren't. And the ones that I really gravitated towards were those that involved mathematics. So uh, everything from multilinear algebra to statistics and econometrics were the things that really um, motivated me, that really kind of intrigued me, that I thought was really natural. And so I found this course at University of Chicago uh, in epidemiology. And I didn't really know a whole lot about epidemiology. I didn't know necessarily what it was. Um, and so I took this course I, I, uh, at Chicago and it really just resonated with me. I thought it was really just intriguing. So then I took another advanced course in epidemiology there. And, and it was really just a great experience. Didn't know what I wanted to do yet, but moved after college to uh, Washington, DC where I worked at a research organization called the Urban Institute. And there I studied uh, primarily demography. So I studied uh, immigration as well as I had a study on, I, I helped a study called the National Survey of Adolescent Males, which was about kind of uh, men, boys and men and young men in the United States and kind of behaviors and, and things of that nature. Uh, so these were both kind of epidemiology, epidemiologically oriented and really kind of um, were really kind of were great experiences, to be honest. Um, and I had great mentors at both places. So then I decided to apply to grad schools in epidemiology. Um, and I got into uh, Johns Hopkins, the School of Public Health there. So I spent four years at Johns Hopkins studying, getting my uh, doctoral degree. So I received my PhD in epidemiology and my focus was on um, mental health, so psychiatric disorders. Uh, and then I graduated um, in 2006 from Johns Hopkins with my PhD and I met, went immediately to RAND uh, where I've been more or less ever since. I had a two year hiatus where I worked elsewhere, but I've been at the RAND Corporation, which is a nonprofit um, organization that conducts policy research to help uh, policymakers, you know, make informed decisions uh, for poli with for policy related matters. Wow! And so, so given all of your experience, uh, epidemiology, behavioral science, mental health, I can't help but think that 2020 and 2021, with all that has been swirling around, given the pandemic and sort of its after effects, I can't help but think that all of those experiences dovetail nicely, but you must have had an incredibly important year. And so can you just talk a little bit about the last year um, and sort of how all of these experiences that you had have sort of helped, um, I don't know, it made, made that such an important year for you and for us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, it's so funny in hindsight, it's, actually, it's not funny, but before we knew kind of what we were getting into in the year, I think one of the last outings I, I had was to an opera at the Kennedy Center where I, I went with my friend David and we took a picture and posted it on Instagram and it said an infectious disease doctor and an epidemiologist go to the opera in the middle of a pandemic or at the beginning of a pandemic, um, not knowing really what was in store. Um, I went my own path. It's interesting to note that friend David of mine um, was the director in Washington, D.C. of the Moderna clinical trial. He's an infectious disease doctor, so he oversaw the Moderna vaccine trial, um, and that's what his life, you know, his year was for him. For me, uh, you know, trained in epidemiology, as the as we were learning more about the infectious of the disease, the, the infectious nature of the disease, that was really um, top of mind. I was trying to follow the epidemiology behind it, um, how serious it was, what is its things, you know, how transmissible is the virus, how fatal is it, or how much you know disease, who gets um, sickest and who doesn't. Um, but soon after, you know, then, you know, epi infectious disease epidemiologists kind of took that over and then it was no longer, I didn't feel like that was where my time is best spent. But at the same time, things were happening. Businesses were closing, schools were, were going to a new status. So I shifted my focus to think about 
what are the implications of these economic factors? What are the implications of physical distancing? How can we support individuals through those times? Because I knew that these measures, whether it's a loss of a job or whether it's um, being isolated from family or friends, could have you know, real mental health effects, whether that um, exhibits itself in anxiety, whether it exhibits itself in depression, whether people start drinking more alcohol, you know, I was trying to be on top of that. And so that's really where my focus went. And that's where my focus has been uh, for the past year is really thinking about, um, especially, you know, for me, I've become very fascinated and interested in how job loss contributes to mental health effects. Um, and, and we've seen job loss like we haven't seen before and how the safety nets in place for people who lose jobs can really be instrumental in, in uh, ensuring that they, that, you know, that their mental health doesn't suffer dramatically. Yeah, so, I mean, such important work as we come out of this and, and as we see sort of the effects of, you know, the after pandemic effects, both mentally and physically on people, such important work. And so if, as you reflect a little bit on your Canisius High School experience, any, any things you learned there that, that sort of have helped guide you in your professional career? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I said before that Mr. McAndres was an influential mentor and teacher of, of mine, what comes to mind was um, classes that we took where, so I, I forget what, the, <laughs> what class it was in, but we, had a final project and she allowed some creativity. So I actually took video that I filmed. I did three interviews um, with people talking about mortality and talking about, um, um, you know, talking about healthcare and mortality. And, you know, really, it was really focused on death and dying. Um, and maybe it was about assisted suicide, to be honest, as I think back, because. Jack Kevorkian was like a big, it was in the news sure. those days and sure. things of that nature. And so I remember I talked to a nurse who was in um, the military, so a veteran nurse. I talked to uh, a person who had a terminal illness and I spoke to one other person, but you know, I was invited to go to these, uh, to speak to these people, to reach out, to interview them and to have these discussions about mortality and, and death. And that was really um, instrumental to me. You know, I ended up, I said before I study uh, mental health, my, my main focus is suicide and suicide prevention. And that's where I spend most of my time thinking about um, whether in military populations and veteran populations or in the general population. Right. So that experience was really formative because it made me think about life and death in a very different way um, and in a way that I think is really important um, to think about. And so um, that was really helpful for me, that experience. The other experience is, you know, Canisius has this mandate, it was a requirement really to do community service in some way. Mm -hmm. And I spent my community service at Canisius in an alcohol and drug treatment center. And you know, so patients who had substance, um, substance issues. And I really learned that, you know, I, I take an approach that I think is the true approach that addiction is a disease, that it's a chronic disease, um, that, you know, there is a, an element of choice in there, but that there is neurochemistry happening that really influences kind of the behaviors of individuals. And that was also really, um, important for me to think about, you know, to, to really think that how can we best support individuals who have substance use issues. And so those two experience, and there's so many actually experiences that, 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 I, that I think about. My experiences on the speech and debate team were really great because I give talks and presentations all the time. And so that prepared me for that. Um, you know, I also took the hardest class in high school, college, graduate school, the hardest class I ever took was at Canisius. And it was my advanced placement studio art class. <laughs> Everyone thinks that that's crazy when I say that, because I've taken some crazy mathematics courses as well. But 
AP Studio Art, you know, for anyone who thinks that art is just kind of throwing paint on a board, there's so much more to it than that. And it was through AP Studio Art that I really learned and really struggled, um, to be honest. Um, I didn't necessarily have the, the artistic talent that I thought I did. So um, that was really interesting. So, so those are some of the experiences. I, I mean, I rattled off a bunch, but um, that were really kind of formative when I look back upon my career or, or upon high school. No, it's great as an interviewer to ask a question like that and to hear that there are too many to name, right? Like <laughs> it's, and, you, and you gave us a great little uh, sample of them, but that's, you know, as, as I, I think that our alumni base, when they watch these videos, uh, they are not going to be surprised to hear that there's too many to, to name, right? And we think we all have so, those, so many of those formative experiences that made us who we are. And uh, it's, it's great to hear that just some of them. And so... So let's, you know, as you, as you think about, um, as we think about these kids graduating today, right? Graduating from Canisius High School, going off to college, graduating from college, entering the work world. Any advice that you would give to these young kids today as they're starting to make their way in the world? Yeah, I think my two pieces of it, I think I have two pieces of advice. So the first is not to, um, not to expect anything, that if there's something that you want, if there's a dream that you have, you have to go out and get it and you have to look for it and you have to seek out opportunities. And I think that that sounds, everyone will probably hear that and say like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But it's really amazing to me how many people really just live in this life of just, you know, whatever is kind of, in, whatever is easiest for them to access is what they feel comfortable with. Sure. whatever is right outside of their door. And sometimes you need to get out of your comfort zone and you need to think about opportunities and experiences that you want to have that'll make you the person that you want to be um, that require effort. Um, and I think that that's really important. So I really would encourage, you know, I would really encourage, you know, these guys to, to really get out there and, and be aggressive and, and really pursue the things that matter to them in a very concentrated and conscientious way. The other thing that I, I'd say is that, honestly, this year has concerned me. And I don't know whether that's I'm just getting older and the world is the same or the world has changed in a, in a way. I find the world very polarized. I find the country very polarized. I find um, there's a lot of exciting movement happening, but there's a lot of um, resistance to a lot of that excitement. I think it's a very divisive um, time in our country's history. And I do hope that, you know, these Kanisha students can be part of the solution. Um, I think if you look at the Ignatian, you know, formation and you look at what Kanisha stands for, it's to help people on the margins. It's to see God in everyone. I would really hope that these students will come out of the world and not be part of that divisiveness, but actually be part of uh, the solution that brings us together. Um, that's what I look forward to seeing in the future. I hope to contribute to it as much as I can, but I also know that, you know, I'm in my 40s and, and that this is really going to be done by those who are younger than us, who are, who are in their 20s and who are really kind of at the beginning of their careers. Yeah. Well said, well put. So let's shift gears a little bit to you and the, your future. Uh, what are your big plans as you're, you know, as we, we come out of this pandemic, obviously you're gonna be very busy with just by nature of who you are and what you do, but what, what are your sort of short term and, and you know, medium term plans? Great question. <laughs> so, <laughs> cause I don't know. I don't yeah. know either. I, <laughs> it, it's really, it's, it's a really interesting question. You know, I have to say that the way that I've lived my life to date is to be pretty adaptive and responsive. Um, so for example, when I went to graduate school, I was studying substance use. Um, but that was right when, th that was between 2002 and 2006. So if you go back to history, that's right when the surge happened. So when American forces became really heavily concentrated in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so, you know, which was around 2005. So we just saw a tremendous amount of activity, um, militaristic activity, um, during which the majority, for example, of the army was deployed at some right. point. So, um, 
So my, my career shifted very dramatically during that time. When I came to RAND, you know, I was studying substance use, but I soon got became heavily involved in looking at the mental health effects of combat trauma and war on our military personnel and our veterans and continue that research. I think it's incredibly important. Uh, similarly, you know, the pandemic happened in 2020. I had to shift. I was not really thinking about employment. The U.S. had, you know, aside from the Great Recession in 2008, 2010, had had a pretty decent employment rate. And all of a sudden, we saw this huge increase in job loss. So, so my research has had to adapt and shift into that area. Um, I've also started, as we talked, I talked before about polarization. I started to use research methods that we I've used to study suicide and behavioral health to study hate and to study, you know, extremism and how people join extremist groups and how they develop these ideologies that are full of hate. So, so I'm pretty adaptive. So, so for me, I just want to continue to conduct research that uses my skills as best possible, but to address issues that are pressing and that are important for uh, America and for our policymakers to think about. I want to continue to have impact. Um, personally, I'm excited to move into our new home, <laughs> um, which we're building uh, in, in a new neighborhood in DC. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm excited uh, to see, I'm actually very interested and excited. I have three nephews and nieces and I'm excited to see, you know, as they, one of them is, will soon be entering college to see where uh, she ends up and what happens with her life and and to see how the other two, you know, mature. It's been amazing. They both live in Washington, D.C. To, so to be able to see them grow up and, and to be part of that has been really, really uh, a blessing. So I'm excited to see that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see what the future holds. And I'm hoping that, you know, to the extent, you know, I, I really, I've shifted. I think that it's interesting. I've taken, um, before in my career for the past 20 years, I don't want to say it's been me first, but it's, it's been about me growing. It's been about me writing papers, writing grants. Um, I, I've noticed a shift and it wasn't a conscientious one, but I've you know started to think about how can I contribute to help those um, younger than me, you know, who are entering the profession, who are just entering the field, how can I help them, you know, I don't want to be prescriptive by any means, but how can I, you know, give them the opportunities and provide, you know, mentorship so that they can grow and flourish. Um, and so I'm really excited to see whether that happens <laughs> and what what what's in store from the younger generation. It's it's in some ways it's a really unfair question, Rajiv, and you've done a great job answering it. And you know, because I have a 12 year old son, and he says to me, you know, every now and again, "What did you want to be when you grew up?" And I always tell him, "I'll let you know when I find, you know, when I grow up." I'll, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what I want to be when I grow up yet. And so, um, but you answered that very well. And listen, I'm really, really grateful for you spending the time with us this morning, telling us your story. You're doing really great, really important work. I'm sure you know that. But, you know, on behalf of the Canisius High School community, thank you. I think the, yeah. things, you're, I think the things you're doing are so important, not only to students our age, uh, students our students' age, but, but for everyone. And so thank you very, very much. Uh, I look forward to keeping in touch. I look forward to hearing what's new and exciting in your world and, and visiting again. And good luck with everything you're doing in Washington. And thank you for joining us this morning. Great. Thanks, Andy. And can I just say one more thing? You know, I just, as you were talking, I just thought one more thing that when you were saying, what's the advice? You know, the other advice um, that I would have, and, and as we think about this year and you think about my profession, behavioral health, I think especially men in society think that they need to be the, the caretakers of everyone. They need mm -hmm. to, I think there's a social pressure to think that they need to be the ones responsible, that they need to be, you know, the ones who don't, you know, falter or don't fall. And I think that that's an, um, that pressure, the mounting pressure placed on guys and, and men in today's societies is real. And I think that it's really important for guys, especially, to know that they need they need to find support networks. Um, they need to be proactive. They can't go at this alone. Uh, whether that's in a partner, whether that's in family, whether that's in chosen family, that your your really tight network of friends who are there for you, you need that support network. Um, 
don't think that you can get by without it. And so you have to, and that requires investing time to find those people, but also to being that support network to others. Um, it will come back, it will be beneficial to you. And I think that that's critically important um, to maintain your mental health, especially in these this fast paced and, and as I said before, very polarized and divisive world. So I'd really encourage them to think about, you know, who their friends are and, and where they get that support and, and make that a priority. Yes, right. Being a man for others does not necessarily mean just helping other people. Sometimes it's you facing inward and making sure that you have the right supports around you. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very well said and very well put. And, and uh, it's a great, uh, I think, a great message to, to end on today. So thank you again. I uh, look forward to seeing you soon and good luck. Absolutely. Thank you. RJ. See ya.